Welcome to another episode of Cybersecurity Weekly. I'm your host, Fred Cobb, Executive Vice President and CISO at InfoSystems. And fortunate today, once again, to have Rob Ashcraft, Senior Cybersecurity Strategist at InfoSystems. Welcome, Rob. Thanks for hanging out. Yes, thanks for having me on another episode. And uh, we're excited again to talk about uh, this, this, this time, uh, the CIS control number seven, email yes. and web browser protection. Indeed, indeed. We have been, uh, if those of you have been tuning in, listening to some of the previous podcasts, you're aware that we've been stepping through uh, the Center for Internet Security, Critical Security Controls. We've covered all of the basic controls, one through six. This is the first in our series on the uh, CIS foundational controls. And as Rob alluded to, uh, we're going to be talking about webmail and uh, not webmail, web browsing, excuse me, and email. And we know web browsing can include webmail. So uh, this one is, uh, I guess, Rob, out there when we're looking at uh, the types of incidents that occur and some of the uh, um, compromises that we see, just some of the headaches that are caused uh, by nefarious actors as they're infiltrating businesses and wreaking a little bit of havoc. This is by far uh, one of the most common attack vectors. Is that a fair statement, you think? No, absolutely. So the whole idea behind this control is minimizing the attack surface and the opportunities uh, for an attacker to basically manipulate human behavior. And so there's a, there's a human element involved when you get into, uh, obviously, web browsing and uh, email activities. And so uh, basically manipulating their behavior through that interaction uh, with the browsers or you know, the, the use of uh, web browsers and email activities, um, it's a very common uh, entry point and uh, attack point for uh, uh, bad actors. Yeah, absolutely. There's several things that uh, one, as a, you know, you as a business owner, you as an, uh, just an individual out there, uh, you know, looking at uh, your personal habits as you're surfing and as you're reading email, but certainly in the business environment, uh, certain things to be aware of uh, that can help to limit uh, your attack footprint, so to speak, around uh, web surfing, around uh, uh, using email clients, whether it's web-based email or whether it's fat clients, uh, whether we're talking about an on-premise exchange server, whether we're talking about um, Office slash Microsoft 365. Um, there's uh, some just basic things you can do, and it it does get frustrating at times when uh, you know we'll get uh, we'll get a call, someone's needing help. And right. you go in and it's weak passwords. It's, hey, did you know you had auto forwarding turned on for the last six months and your emails being exfiltrated out to some nefarious actors, Google account, you know, just some basic things that are easily fixed. And we'll spend next couple of minutes talking about just some things to, to be aware of and some quick fixes for this type of uh, threat. We'll be back with the Cybersecurity Weekly Podcast after we pause for this special message. Security analysts believe cyber attacks will continue to escalate throughout 2020 and are recommending that every company, regardless of industry or size, place immediate focus on cybersecurity training and the tools that will protect you from these attacks. Did you know that you can book a cybersecurity assessment right now with Fred Cobb's team of cybersecurity engineers at InfoSystems, they will help you discover exactly where you are most vulnerable to a cyber attack and make recommendations on how to strengthen your defense in those areas. This is urgent. It's an issue that affects everyone in our community. Visit the InfoSystems website at www.infosystems.biz to request your cybersecurity assessment. Now back to the podcast. Well, I think the idea behind web browsers, uh, even in email clients, is there's a lot of you know, technical flexibility, so to speak, in what they do. So you've got uh, information coming in and out directly from the, uh, from the web. There's a lot of attack vectors that can be connected with the, uh, the interaction of web browsers and, uh, and of course, email uh, clients. So the... Uh, one of the main things, I, I guess, our key points is making sure, that just first of all, that the web browsers or your email clients um, are, are kept up to date, the latest versions of the browsers, 
and clients uh, are being used that are provided by the vendor. Yep, that's a good point. Because uh, as we uh, all know, uh, those of us that work in this arena, we know that there are constant threats due to uh, vulnerabilities uh, that can be exploited. You know, new discoveries uh, made every day, even in the latest and greatest of the, the email client or the web browser. So you have to be on your toes to keep those updates done on a regular basis. Um, yeah, using Firefox as an example, which is a great uh, web browser and uh, generally secure, there was a, uh, um, a vulnerability discovered in that, uh, and then a uh, subsequent patch that came out. And uh, so that's, uh, that's you know, web browsers we, that we suggest. Uh, um, and so along with Chrome or Chromium-based type of browsers. And, and so, uh, yeah, if you don't keep them up to date, then uh, vulnerabilities can, uh, can happen and be exploited. Absolutely. I think it's an important exercise to go through uh, for uh, any IT administrator, uh, any business owner. Uh, I mean, think about it. Email is our lifeblood in just about every uh, situation when it comes to interacting with the outside world, uh, interacting internally, uh, employee to employee. But if you think about it, you know, that email connection that you have to the, the outside world, it it's a, should be thought of as an untrusted connection. I mean, if you think about the things you can do internally, you can secure, you sort of know, uh, you know, um, the rules of engagement on, uh, you know, sending email back and forth internally. You know, uh, the people typically are going to be sending and receiving emails to and from internally. But think about beyond just that edge of your your business or maybe maybe a B2B extension. It is an untrusted world out there, and there's lots of folks that are going to leverage weaknesses in your uh, design, uh, weaknesses in your behavior as human beings to pick up on attacks, um, you know, hence the reason why phishing is so popular. Um, yeah, I guess, and I don't think it's a bad idea just to really perform an assessment uh, top to bottom of your email environment, you know, starting with the uh, endpoint applications to your server or cloud solution and uh, any other supporting uh, network infrastructure and uh, and take a look at that uh, the, the chain of events of how the information is transferring and uh, and then the other part of that is the human factor is uh, you know some security awareness training around uh, the best practices and use of email and what to and what not to do what to look out for yeah, I mean, it's very popular these days, and I'm a big advocate of uh, doing uh, simulated uh, phishing campaigns. You know, there's a particular product, I'll go ahead and mention the name of the product, we like Know Before at InfoSystems because it enables us, and we do a lot of managed Know Before where we are responsible for creating the campaigns, vetting them with uh, our point of contacts uh, at the customer site, and then uh, targeting, you know, groups uh, of individuals within an organization to determine susceptibility the following victim to uh, a fish campaign. And, uh, you know, as sure. you you do that uh, and history proves, you know, if you've ever done it for the first time, you tend to get a, maybe a higher number than you um, care to admit to or want to see. But as you continue to uh, provide that type of reinforcement, uh, you get uh, the employees much more aware, much more trained up on how to look for um things that could happen, you know, coming in via email that could release malware, release ransomware, all those bad things. So it's good sure, to you're test. You're strengthening one of the big variables, which is the, the human factors. So I, I totally agree with you. Hey, you know, another uh, area that I see with uh, emails that's often as I'm doing assessments uh, or audits um, is uh, not implementing um, things like DMARC, uh, records or implementing uh, the sender uh, policy framework SPF or DKIM standards. Mm -hmm. And often I find that those have not been looked at or, or set up properly. And so, um, and you may be asking yourself, gee, what are that? You know, what's a, a DMARC and an SPF or a DKIM? But certainly uh, you, can, you can do some research on those. This is something you can, you can set up yourself. It is a little, a little bit of a task and, and it requires some, uh, you know, some, some know-how. But certainly, you can call a third party in like Info Systems or that to help you. This is a quick thing to do, and this uh, will, will do uh, a lot to greatly lower the chance of spoofed or modified emails that are coming from a valid domain. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know what, uh, Rob, 
was just uh, referring to there are ways to do uh, uh, second level, th even third level uh, authentication and validation that emails are coming from uh, the the person uh, that uh, truly is the sender as opposed to a spoof situation. Right. And uh, the, uh, again, it, these are some basic things that, you know, it's not tied to a particular type of uh, email application like uh, does this does DKIM or DMARC work for Gmail? Yes, you don't have to be running Exchange. It's more of a global type or agnostic type of a thing you can do. And it really cuts down on uh, you getting rid of spoofed email. Uh, obviously, you know, you've got some of your, your spam filtering, such as your proof points, your barracudas, those types of things. They can do, a, you know, a reasonable job, but stuff still gets through. So just having those extra layers there can certainly help. Robin, the big thing that I got to mention is big thing that I, I still see quite a bit is, uh, uh, in, particularly in the business climate, uh, the the forwarding or the auto forwarding. Uh, people haven't gone right. in and, and disabled that. Uh, this happened to a good friend of mine just this week. So he was getting ready to uh, close on a, a refi because interest rates are, are nice and low right now. And uh, he had gotten to the point where he was ready to um, send funds to the title company for the close. The morning he was supposed to send those funds, he got an email from the title company, supposedly the title company that said, please reply back to this email and we will uh, provide you with routing numbers where to send the funds for your closing. Mm. Uh, there were a couple of typos and he's a, he's a pretty savvy individual. So there were a couple of typos so he called the person uh, that uh, was in the email, uh, we'll, we'll call her uh, Miss Smith, and Miss Smith said, um, no, I didn't send you that email. So mm. the timing was impeccable. It was down to the yeah. hour. How do you think that happened? Yeah, certainly a man in the middle attack or something where there, uh, somebody has intercepted uh, by email forwarding, as you just mentioned, those Absolutely. emails. They're seeing those, and then they're, they're – you know, that that's turned in from an auto attack into a, a, a regular hack, and somebody is is, is going in and, and setting that up. And it had not been for your uh, your friend who was uh, savvy enough and intelligent enough to notice something was a little off. I better double check this. Uh, that could have been really bad. Yes. So uh, I know we've sort of uh, hammered on the email side of that uh, more so than, than the web browser, but I think it's important because you know there's ACH transfer fraud. Uh, there's sure. electronic fund transfer fraud, fraud that's happening right now. The situation we just mentioned where there's someone active in uh, an email account, seeing email going back and forth through auto authority, and they're able to do intercepts and pretend to be uh, and, uh, and all these things where DKM, DMARC, and SPF may have, you know, helped in that particular situation. Certainly, they might have blocked yeah. it before it ever got to the uh, – uh, the uh, actual individual that was uh, getting targeted. But yeah, without getting too too deep into it, uh, a couple of things that uh, I think about when I hear a, a scenario like that uh, is uh, is certainly maybe uh, implement, especially in an organization, implement multi-factor authentication uh, mm -hmm. for email access. That's certainly going to cut down uh, accounts being compromised. Uh, implement strong passwords. Um, another, you know, just a, a good best practice. Um, and then on the other end of receiving things, um, we all, we always suggest that they block unnecessary file types or have some type of spam email content filtering that's uh, examining the payload of an email coming in to see if uh, uh, there's something uh, nefarious attached. We see that all the time with a, a PDF or something, an executable uh, being attached that uh, is disguised as something else and, and uh, causing some major chaos. Yep, absolutely. I guess uh, I want to also mention here uh, while we're talking, highly recommend, uh, you know, if you're on Office 365, which is now Microsoft 365, uh, I keep uh, wanting to mention that because uh, the, the recent name change, but um, the uh, there's a tool out there called Microsoft Secure Score. And if you're the administrator of your tenancy, you can go in and it's very easy to run that tool against your Office 365, Microsoft 365 um, installation. It'll come back and give you a risk analysis and a score, uh, you know, based on um, your settings 
here's your risk exposure. Here's some things you might want to tighten up. Very easy to do. It's a, a service that uh, you know we do a lot for our customers. If you're savvy about uh, your understanding of uh, your Office 365 setup, Microsoft 365 setup, you can easily do it yourself and then look at things you might want to do to increase your score uh, and get a better score. Also, the CIS benchmarks are out there yep. for change or out there for other email systems as well. Uh, so, how you know, yeah, absolutely. So just wanted to mention that uh, while we were discussing that, uh, do a risk analysis, do a risk assessment, do a, uh, you know, a security assessment of that application because it is crucial to your business and it is a, Unfortunately, it's a big gaping door if it's not configured right for the bad guys to get into your environment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we we perform things like that. We do uh, what we used to call an Office 365 assessment, now Microsoft 365. But uh, nonetheless, you have their organizations, uh, ours and others uh, like that, that have an expertise in that area. Hey, I do want to roll back on one thing. You know, kind of uh, we got so far into the in the email type of the security, but also I want to look back on web based. Uh, and web content uh, type of uh, security. We also strongly recommend in this category that uh, uh, an organization utilize what's called URL filtering or web content filtering. Uh, there's all kinds of solutions. Often they're baked in now to the firewalls, these next gen type of firewalls that have this available. But there's there's other ways to do that. And sometimes uh, uh, organizations will actually use two or three different ways to uh, uh, I guess, uh, defend in, their, in, in the way that the uh, web is being used and what's um, coming through uh, through web content. So this prevents access, right, to um, websites that maybe provide content that's objectionable, first of all, uh, potentially harmful um, or uh, even non-work-related type of distracting sites and social media sites and things that <laughs> have no work relevancy. And uh, perhaps the organizations, you know, they're easy on the policy, uh, but they, they can be overused or, or just, uh, you know, what we call cyber loafing uh, a little too much and, and work not getting done. So these uh, URL filters, content filterings are great uh, uh, for that type of uh, uh, monitoring and, and also for defense. Absolutely. And, you know, you got to get past culturally as a company to think about, oh, you're being a big brother. You're, you know, you're you're snooping on uh, the habits of your employees. Uh it, ever more so with, you know, with the COVID crisis and so many people telecommuting, it's not really, hey, I'm snooping on you. It's, uh, you know, we need to make sure you're protected. You know, you're uh, you're in this uh, disparate uh, type configuration now where you're, you know, not everyone is in the office and you're running through, uh, you know, the same type of protection, unless you're VPNing, of course. But if you have your own egress point straight to the Internet as a telecommuter, uh, you can have these agent-based, uh, cloud-based solutions, what you're talking about there. So regardless of where you are, uh, how you're connecting to the Internet, you can still put uh, you know, security controls in place to protect your, um, your employee surfing habits, and that protects your business. Yeah, these solutions will kind of uh, match. Uh, they generally have a defined database that they match against, and uh, this either is going to permit or deny access to sites based on what's found in that database. Also, they can be defined by your IT policy. And so there's uh, a lot of granting or control around uh, what these uh, UR, URL or content filtering solutions can do. Absolutely. Well, I think we've uh, we've covered just the basics. Highly encourage those of you that are listening to this podcast, dig deep into uh, CIS control number seven. Understand uh, just everything out there that is uh, uh, really a bad a bad thing potentially if you're not configured appropriately with content filtering solutions with uh, email protection uh, again there's no getting around the fact that you have to communicate with the outside world in most business situations using using email so there's things you can do to really lock it tight uh, lock it down tight and ensure that you're protected uh, for just about every type of attack if you do the due diligence and uh, Study number seven and go into a little bit more detail than what we've covered today. I would encourage you to do that. Uh, but uh, I think that about wraps it. Rob, anything else to add around this topic before we close it up? No, I think, you know, a lot of times we look at these and think, gosh, there's so many rules or, you know, best practices in place. Why do I need all this? And the, the idea behind it is there is no silver bullet. We say this a lot when we talk about security overall and, 
uh, is strengthening a security posture of an organization. So the more a defense in depth that you can have, the better. Every time you do something like this, enable content filtering or do your DMARC SPF DKIM standards or, you know, run a, uh, a Microsoft Secure Score tool. Every time you do something like this, it's a win for your organization and, and protecting yourself from, uh, from attack. Absolutely. Well, thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. We'll keep the episodes coming. Uh, we'll be moving through the rest of the CIS controls, and we'll be throwing in some other uh, good cybersecurity topics uh, mixed in with uh, our talk about controls in upcoming episodes. So, again, thank you. Appreciate your uh, your patronage, and we will see you soon. Thank you. Goodbye.